Okay, good evening. Welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 209 to 211, which read as follows. Ayoge yunjamattanang yogasmincha ayojanang ayojayang Atang hitwa piyagahi pihetattanu yoginang Mapiyehi samaganti apiyehi kudachanang Piyanang adasanang dukhang apiyanang chadasanang Tasma piyang na kairatha piyapayo hi papako Kantha te sang na vijanti ye sang na thi piyapiyang Which means One who is involved with things one shouldn't be involved in and in those things that one should be involved in doesn't get involved having abandoned what is useful atta and clinging to what is dear to them they will end up Envying those who were more involved or better involved, those who were strenuous or got got work done. Don't uh, don't associate, or one shouldn't associate. One shouldn't hold on to what is dear or what is dear whatsoever, what is not dear whatsoever. For not to see what is dear, this is suffering, as well as seeing what is not dear. For that reason, make nothing dear. Piyapayo hipapako. For it is, for the loss of what is dear is evil. <coughs> and here, evil just means bad or unpleasant. Kantate sangnavijanti. There is no, there are no bonds, binds, there are no fetters. For that, for those who hold nothing dear or undear, not dear. Yesang nati payapiyang. For those who have nothing that is dear or the opposite of dear, which is uh, unpleasant. So dear is maybe not. It's an awkward translation. Pia means something you value, something you cherish, something you hold on to, something you love. We might say. <clears throat> it's probably the most common usage of the word love And though love can mean many different things When we say we love cheesecake Or when you say you love your partner Even when you say you love your parents um, It's often, or love your children It's often associated with clinging Rather than appreciation or, or simply friendliness so that's what Pia means. And we're in the Pia Vaga. We've just started. This is the first story from the Pia Vaga, which means the chapter on dearness or holding things on cherishing. So this was this verse is supposed to have been said in regards to a story about a family. A family Whose members were very dear to each other We have a mother and a father and their son And they were living together in harmony 
But then one day the Buddha came to their 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 area, <coughs> and the son heard him speak and was so uh, encouraged by the things the Buddha said that he decided that he would he wanted to become a monk. So he asked his parents, and his parents refused. They said, "No, you can't." And they tried to keep watch on him because they figured he would sneak away and go become a monk if they didn't. And so whenever the the mother would go out, the father she would tell the father to look after him and watch him and and spy on him or basically hold him prisoner. And the same when the father went out, he would tell the mother, remind the mother to do the same. Now one day the father went out and the mother was weaving or spinning wool or something. And so she would sit in the doorway of their their hut or their home and uh, just to make sure he never didn't even leave the house. I don't it doesn't say how old this boy was, but maybe he was just young enough to become a novice, I don't know. They loved him so much that they wanted to protect him and, and keep him prisoner even. Uh, and but he he asked her if he could go outside to use the the facilities, maybe the outhouse or something. He had to go, maybe water the bushes. I don't know. And he had to make a bowel movement, of some sort. And so he asked her to move out of the way. You know, I can, I, I'm just going to go outside for a second. So she let him go outside and went back to her work. And as soon as he got outside, he ran to the monastery, asked the monks to ordain him. They ordained him, which is not really allowed, but this may have been before it was required to have your parents' permission. Or Anyway, it's just a story that the detail is not so important. But the parents, uh, when the father came home and he went into the house and, where's our son? Usually he would greet the father when he came home, didn't do that. Where did our son go? Oh, he went out uh, to the washroom. I don't know. He's he's not back yet. <laughs> oh, and the father said, "Oh, I know. If he's not here, he looked everywhere for him. He said, if he's not here, he must have gone to the monastery." <clears throat> so the father went to the monastery. Sure enough, he saw his son with a shaven head and wearing robes, and he was so aggrieved, so sad, thinking to himself, "How can I go home?" And live without my only dear son And so then and there he, he said I'm not going home And he asked the monks to ordain him as well Shaved his head, put on the robes, became a monk The mother sitting at home Wondering where the husband and the son have gone She said, well, um, I guess Probably the son would have gone to the monastery And so she heads off to the monastery Sees them both and says well, what the heck am I going to do at home if they're both at the monastery? I better ordain as well. And she went to the bhikkhunis and they ordained her, shaved her head, put on the robes. Which which sounds like a very heart, heartening story, you know. The, the, the son led both his mother and father to become monks, but uh, it didn't work out the best. <clears throat> they uh, After they ordained, it says they did nothing but socialize. They were so accustomed and and attached to each other, accustomed to being in each other's presence, attached to each other's presence and company and interactions, that they did nothing but sit around and socialize and chat. And the monks got annoyed, upset or disturbed, at least the ones who weren't yet uh, far advanced in their meditation. And so they went to the Buddha <clears throat> And they said Venerable sir This family We kind of regret letting them become monks Because now all they do is sit around And chat and socialize They're not accomplishing anything Except in increasing their clinging and, and disturbing the monastery And So the Buddha called them up and, Is this true? Yeah, and he scolded them and said this is not the way of. It's not the way to ha real happiness. Let's see what did the Buddha exactly say? 
he said, why do you do this? This isn't the proper way for you to conduct yourself. But, but Venerable Sir, it's impossible for us to live apart. And he said, once you leave home, having left home, this is very improper. And then he taught, taught the verse, basically. Verses. So, we have a lesson from the story, we have a lesson from the verses. From the story, I guess there are two lessons. The first most obvious one is uh, we don't approve of chatting and socializing. So in in a monastery, in a meditation center, it's why we have these sort of rules. Not just because the Buddha said not to and, and said it's improper. <clears throat> but you got to admit, if the Buddha says that something is improper, it's probably good idea to follow even blindly because well we we don't know many many things and taking your teacher's advice is often a good thing good sort of default until you have reason to doubt but you know, we can find reasons easily of course socializing and and chatting in specific are are, are quite distracting from our practice and reinforcing of our defilement, the bad things inside that we're trying to change about ourselves, bad habits, are quite reinforced simply by engaging in idle speech because it's very difficult to be mindful, it's very habitual, just the act of speeching is caught up in so much of our habits, our manners of speaking, uh, the topics of speech, you know, often we sit around gossiping and, and talking bad about other people and so on, that sort of thing. Teasing, manipulating, joking, and all of this. It's just part of our um, habits that are caught up with speech, which are very difficult to change. It's not that speaking can't be mindful. You can even be mindful as you're speaking, mindful of your lips moving, even mindful of the sound of your own voice. But it's just mostly we're not doing that. And that's the re not the reason why we sit and chatter, not as a meditation exercise usually. But we shouldn't think that silence is necessary. It isn't. It never was. It was something that the Buddha criticized, in fact. If you say, I'm not going to talk no matter what, you shouldn't ever go to that extreme. You can, for the most part, not talk. And there were monks who did this. They didn't talk hardly at all, but then... They didn't talk at all, actually. But then every five days or so, they would get together and they would talk all night. Talk about the Dhamma. But it was a means of getting feedback and, and interacting with your fellows. It's just important. Just like we talk every morning, so you have a chance to interact with someone who has a little bit of background and experience. Uh, but the deeper lesson, of course, is this idea of holding something dear. So the real lesson this story gives to us and other stories of the Buddha or of the Buddha's time uh, is of how strongly people cling to each other, how how strongly uh, this this habit becomes, how 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 powerful it can be. You know, the strength of their attachment was preventing them from allowing this young man to do something great. Right? How often you hear about um, parents not allowing their children to become ordained? I mean, I do in in Asian circles anyway. Not because they think Buddhism is bad, they're generally Buddhists themselves. There are cases where parents don't want their kids to ordain, especially in the West, because they think Buddhism is evil and 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 wrong and so on. But that's not the case often in the in the East, in Buddhist countries. They just don't want it because they're they're so attached to their kids, even attached and worried about their kids' future. They want their kids to be rich and and. In, in society and carry on their name and have kids they want grandkids and that sort of thing so it's quite horrific to think that their kids might become monks and then how how strong was the attachment once he had ordained that they couldn't live without him they couldn't continue on their lives they, they were so desperate that they decided to ordain even though they didn't seem to be all that inclined towards Buddhist practice and then once they were ordained, their attachment was so strong that even the son wasn't able to practice. 
because he was so involved with socializing with his parents. So it gives us this this example of very strong attachment. And the verses themselves uh, provide sort of the lesson on why it's not a good idea to, to attach. And there's three lessons. Each verse is actually a little bit different and you can find a distinct lesson from each of them that that describes a very important part of the Buddha's teaching. So the first verse uh, is mostly uh, describing uh, our acts, acts and omissions. It talks about getting involved with things you shouldn't get involved in. I use the word involved, yoga. Yoga means something like bound or attached, but not exactly attached, tied to. Yoga is kind of like, I've talked about this before, from yoke, a yoke in English, where the yoke on the ox is this thing that ties it to the cart so it can pull it. So when you're when you're a harnessed to a cart, you, you do the work of pulling the cart. That's, as I understand, how the word evolved. So it, it's used often in Buddhism to talk about this um, person who is dedicated, a dedicated practitioner. <coughs> Yoga vachara is a very common Buddhist word Someone who is engaged in the work So, But there's things that you shouldn't engage in You shouldn't get involved and you shouldn't work at And so one who engages in those things And doesn't engage in the things that you should engage in is, uh, is And then he says it's going to be Jealous or envious Is going to feel bad when they see everyone else In a monastic setting especially Or in a meditation center Everyone else is becoming enlightened And they're still Still useless uh, The Buddha gives, gives an example Not here but It's a famous uh, simile of A cow herd Or a shepherd You, know, you might think of a a person who works, a servant in a in a rich household, or a person, you know, cows we don't think of so much because we don't think of cows as highly as they would have in the time of the Buddha. But it's the equivalent of being surrounded by riches, but having to take care of them, like a banker. A person can work in a bank surrounded by such wealth, but have no access to the bank. A person who shepherds or cow herds cows Surrounded by very valuable livestock But they're just working for a minimum wage They don't actually get to taste the milk from the cows Or the cheese Or or the meat now as we kill the cows <coughs> You don't get any of the benefit From the animals A person who works in a, in a mansion Can be surrounded by great luxury But never have access to it They can't sleep in the beds Or sit in the chairs Or eat the food they get minimum wage and then they go home Or they sleep in the servants' quarters So the lesson here is about uh, Acts and omissions In Buddhism, of course, it's democratic Or it's, I mean democratic isn't the right word it's, There's equality in the sense that it's accessible to everyone It's not a, it's not a case where you're, you're set in your Social class So it's different in that You have the option To become rich in Buddhism You have the option to be the person who owns the cows To be the person who owns the money in the bank All you have to do is do the work Engage in what you should engage in Don't engage in what you shouldn't engage in <clears throat> So this re this relates to actions Karma really there's a story of um, a monk who was very, very much attached to his food. He lived alone, and this is a common thing. I've seen this. It's discouraging how common it can be. Monks live alone because they're jealous of their gains. They live in a village, and they're surrounded by people who, for lack of a better monk, a better monastery, go always go and, and pay respect and give offerings to this monk. So anytime another monk comes, they're very protective of their their gains, right? The things they hold dear. And so they'll chase the other monks away. So you you have to be a little bit suspicious when you see a monastery with only one monk. It's it's 
unfortunately common for that to be the case uh, So this is a story in the Buddha's time It was even the case uh, There was this monk who was in this sort of situation And another monk came And this monk was so profoundly peaceful in his demeanor He would walk slowly when he talked It was thoughtful And he was an arahant He was enlightened as it turns out <clears throat> But this monk, of course, didn't know that. He was just scared because this was clearly a powerful sort of spiritual individual. And he thought to himself, I'm ruined. If the, if the, if the people of the village see this monk, I'll never get any support. And so he arranged it. So in the morning, he said he would ring the bell. And in the morning, he went and touched the bell with his finger and said, oh, I've rung the bell. This monk hasn't come. And he went to the village and they asked, oh, where's the other monk? We heard there's another monk living there. And he said, oh, I think he's sleeping in. I rang the bell and he didn't come. And the, the lay, there was one laywoman who was taking care of him who, who made very, you know, uh, sort of luscious, what's the word? Very uh, delicate, su superior food, good food, delicious food, refined food, fine food. And uh, she said, oh, well, then take back, you eat some food here, and then take back food for him in your bowl. And so he ate the meal, and she put food in his bowl for the other monk, and he looked at it and he said, I can't let him taste this, or he'll never leave. He'll be so attached to the food that he'll stick around, and then I'm ruined. And so on the way back to the monastery, he dumped the food out on the side of the road. The other monk, the Arahant, had woken up, of course, early in the morning. He wasn't lazy or wasn't sleeping in. and He knew what the other monk had done, I think. He had some kind of psychic ability to, know, to see that the monk was doing that. And at any rate, he knew that the monk had not actually rung, rang the bell. And he thought to himself, I can't live with such a person. And he went on his way. The monk, who was very much attached to the food and as a result getting in great, engaging in practices he really shouldn't have been engaging in uh, ended up uh, being born in hell and ended up becoming a I think he was uh, there was this monk in the time of our Buddha yes this was a monk it starts with an M Mendica maybe I can't remember one monk who uh, not Mendica Malukia maybe I can't remember he, he he never got enough to eat as a result of his bad karma of throwing out this food that was dedicated designated for this other monk. He never got enough food, and all the time he was ordained, until finally Sariputta was the one who ordained him, and uh, may have been Mendaka now that I think. And uh, I don't remember his name. Someone's going to tell me what the name was eventually. Sari Buddha had to had to feed him with a spoon, and finally he was dying. And Sari Buddha, on the last day, uh, Sari Buddha went for alms. He went. They went for alms together, and this monk didn't get any food. He said, and neither of them got any food because of the bad karma of this monk. The story is a very long story. When he was born, he was born a beggar, and the, as soon as he was born. As soon as he was conceived, the whole company of beggars didn't get anything to eat. They kicked his parents out, and his parents didn't get anything to eat. And then once he was born, none of them got anything to eat, so they kicked him out, and he never got anything to eat, until finally Sariputta found him and ordained him. And he still didn't get anything to eat. Sariputta took him on alms, none, neither of them got anything to eat. Sariputta told them to stay at home, Sariputta went on alms, sent food back with a novice to him. The novice ate the food on the way. Sariputta went back to the monastery uh, and, and asked him if he'd eaten. He said, I'm fine. He was an arahant at that point, I think. And Sariputta took his food, took his bowl, and actually with his own hand, hand fed into his mouth. And just before he passed away, he got a, a, a real meal. He actually got food to eat. And I can't remember his name. Uh, but the story, the, the the story here is about his his evil deeds because of his craving. And this is, of course, just one of many many stories of how clinging, or holding something dear, something silly like food, right? 
can lead us to do such evil. When we hold people dear, we, when we cherish other people, the things we'll do to get what we want. That's why I think you could extrapolate to why things like rape occur and, and that sort of thing, it's horrible things that happen. It's why people go to war, because they cherish what other people have or they cherish what they have. We cling to our possessions. We cling to nationalities. We cling to color and so many things. Wealth is something rich people clinging to wealth. Now we see the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, and this class warfare fighting. And uh, you know, the truth of it is, from a Buddhist perspective, that the rich are, are just trading places with the poor every lifetime. So if you're rich and stingy, then you get poor, and then you realize how awful it is to be stingy, and so you, tr you start to be a little more generous, and then maybe you become rich again. But we're seeing less and less generosity, I think, and that's why the, the disparity, why people are, so few people are rich, so few, few people actually have um, wealth. Or, or or affluence, luxury, because while well, they've they've traded places, they've done some good things that give them that, and probably when they die, they're going to lose it all. So the first verse deals with this this idea that when we hold things dear, it leads us to do evil things. It leads us to fail to do good things. It's why the, this family was unable to practice meditation. And in our meditation, this is the important lesson that it prevents us from being mindful when we start to get off track and thinking about the past or the future, greedy about or clinging to things that we might get or things that we had or so on. Uh, it leads us to fail to be mindful. That's why entertainment is something we should put aside during a meditation course, because it gets in the way of our mindfulness. The second verse deals more directly with the suffering. It says, uh, yes, seeing what is not dear, that's suffering, and seeing what you don't like, that's suffering, and what you like when you don't see that, that's also suffering. And uh, many stories like this, uh, the story, of course, of Patachara, who lost her two children and her, her, her husband. She was traveling back to see her family, and her husband got bitten by a snake, and then one of her babies was, uh, was taken or carried away by a, a bird. She had just given birth, and she placed, she, she left the older son by the side of the river, this river, and she crossed the river with the baby, left the baby on the side of the, on the other side, started to cross back the river, and uh, then she turned around and saw that this bird had seen her newborn baby and thought it was a piece of meat and grabbed it. And so she waved at the bird in the middle of the river, trying to chase, trying to scare it off. And the older child on the other bank saw her waving and thought, no, oh, she's calling me, and got into the river and got swept away by the river. She lost both of her children. And when she got home to her parents, now completely alone, she found out her parents had died and their, and their house had burnt down in the storm. And she went crazy. She lost her mind. She was so distraught that she just was completely overwhelmed. Such suffering comes from I mean, the potential for such suffering. It's not that you can't enjoy the things that you hold dear. It's just that you engage in this kind of uh, happiness that is fraught with uncertainty and is dependent. Right? In, in mindfulness, we try to become independent. It's another approach to happiness. It's much more sustainable. It's much more happy, really. Because we think we, these things make us happy. They only give us greater and greater clinging. The happiness disappears and we're left with craving and clinging.
Another story is Santati. That we have many stories, but Santati is another example. He was uh, he was a, a minister to a king, and he got rewarded, and he ended up living like a king for a while. And his girlfriend, this dancer, who he was very fond of, she dies all of a sudden just in front of his eyes while she's dancing because she was, I guess, starving herself. It was a thing for dancers to do. It still is, I suppose. And she suddenly got nerve, some kind of nerve damage and died. And he had to go see the Buddha and the Buddha had to explain to him, oh yes, this is what happens when you hold things dear. Impermanence. So the second verse relates to the suffering that comes from from clinging. The third verse relates specifically to uh, the the clinging that comes from holding things dear. So the clinging aspect itself. Right? It says there are no binds, there are no fetters for those who hold nothing dear, and that's really the point. We we don't we don't see how dangerous it is to get attached to things. We don't see how much suffering is involved, how distraught we can become when the things we hold dear. People who hold on to relatives and believe family is so important are the first ones to grieve deeply and really in a way that they would never wish on anyone else when they lose their relatives. And even when our relatives are there, the more clinging we have towards them, we think, well, it's good to hold on to your family. But these are the ones that fight the most with their relatives, that argue when, when the relatives are not the way they want them to be. If a stranger said something to you, you might not react, but when or a stranger did something you didn't expect, it doesn't bother you. But when your relatives change, sometimes it's just their children doing things they don't want, like dyeing their hair or wearing different clothes, not getting good marks on their, their tests, someone else's kid doesn't do well in school maybe you're happy because it means your your child is superior to them you feel proud of your children but when your children do not well because of your attachment to them you're scared for their future and not just as a, your duty as a parent to teach them and help them but you suffer <coughs> children suffer when their parents uh, say things to them right if another person were to criticize you you might be able to shrug it off but when your parents do often you get very angry when your parents uh, scold you or so on because of attachment because we we're so uh, caught up in our desire for them to be a certain way and why I, I, it's interesting to especially stress the fact that each verse specifies a different aspect of the teaching is because these three together the clinging the action the karma and the suffering that comes from it are the cycle of samsara it's called uh, kilesa kama vipaka these three are the circle of of craving circle of of life i guess in buddhism when you have craving then there is uh, there is actions You act out on it We do bad things, evil things Things that hurt ourselves, that hurt others We fail to do good things Of course, because we're so infatuated With getting what we want And we suffer Because the the, the, the actions lead to suffering That's the whole point it would, They wouldn't be bad They wouldn't be considered evil If they didn't lead to suffering But they do Clinging to good things and our aversion to bad things leads us to suffer, leads us to, to do these things, manipulate others, hurt others. And as a result, we suffer. We suffer when we don't get what we want. We suffer when we get what we don't want, revenge and so on. And of course, the suffering leads us to... Uh, to, to cling more, right? We cling to when bad things happen to us, when, when we suffer, we do whatever we can to fix it, <clears throat> to get a pleasant experience. And we create more and more clinging. Because of the clinging, then there's more suffering. Defilements lead to 
Action, action leads to results, results, we react to them again and so we create this snowball effect. This is why even in meditation you can see this happening. You can see how when you get upset about something then you get upset about that and you build and build the upset. That's when it becomes a real problem. Same with craving. If you want something, it's just wanting. But when you obsess over it and you like the fact that you're wanting, you feel the pleasure associated with wanting, then you increase it. And so the final part of the third verse <clears throat> gives, of course, the opposite, the way out. That really a, a much better way, a much more peaceful and, and happy way to live is when you don't hold anything dear or undear. You, you change this, this whole philosophy. You abandon the idea that happiness can come from cherishing things or um, being averse to certain things. And you cultivate an open mind. The you know, ability to experience the whole spectrum of reality. Because we have two choices. We can limit our experiences to those things that we like. Or we can stop liking and we can be open to all experiences. Of course, the former sounds good on paper, but is is fraught with, with dangers and problems. And is a, is a cause, is the reason why there's so much suffering in the world because there is so much suffering in the world it's an undeniable fact as much as we want to ignore it the reality is there is great suffering in the world and it's all because it's all because of our clinging because of our attachments because of holding cherishing certain things and hating and despising other things So that's what we try. That's why mindfulness is so central to Buddhism. It's why we're so focused on mindfulness. Because mindfulness is that middle way. It is the avoiding of the two extremes. It is a third option where you don't have to chase after things or run away from things. Where you simply experience things as they are. There's no more good. There's no more bad. There's not even any me or mine to cling to it. There only is experience, it is what it is. And so by simply reminding yourself of that every moment when you can see or hear, have seeing just be seeing, have hearing just be hearing, you create a new perspective, a new way of looking at reality instead of things you have to fix and control to being things that you should experience and understand. So a very good set of verses. That's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you for listening. Wish you all the best.